and welcome to the Headache Doctor podcast. I'm Dr. Taves and it is my mission to empower everyone with headaches and migraines to break free from a life of fear and dependence and thrive in everything they do. This is episode four and in this episode we are going to talk all about triggers. In the migraine world especially, triggers are a big, big topic of conversation. So we are going to talk about triggers. I'm anyone with headaches or migraines, um, like I said, especially in the migraine world, has gone through the healthcare system and had a conversation with a provider about triggers. I can almost guarantee it. If you haven't had a conversation with a provider about triggers, you likely have done your own exploration, uh, Google search, um, talking to a friend, or even just exploring things in your daily life that may trigger a migraine. So these are very, very important to understand. Now, as a physical therapist, one of the things that I get asked uh, all the time is if you, if, if you being me, if I'm working on the neck, if I'm restoring function to the neck, if I'm treating an injury to the neck, what if my migraines are triggered by hormones? What if my migraines are triggered by different types of food? Uh, what if I'm sensitive to barometric pressure changes? Um, my migraines seem to be irritated with different smells or lights or sounds. Um, and then another category is physical activity, posture. Uh, what if my jaw seems to be involved? I get jaw pain and that tends to trigger, uh, increase my symptoms with my migraines. Those are all valid questions. I think this is one of the most confusing elements about migraines is that there are so many different things that can trigger, lead to, uh, and increase the symptoms of a migraine. So what usually happens? You have that conversation with your provider. Oftentimes, uh, I've actually had patients that fly to Johns Hopkins and meet with the, the world's leading expert in, in migraines, a, a neurologist that spent his career treating migraines and, and basically the conversation is in, an in-depth conversation about avoiding triggers. Um, oftentimes, the those that have been in the field for a while will get really in-depth with certain food triggers, uh, which is very, very helpful. But avoiding triggers is one of the primary treatment approaches uh, in our healthcare system at the moment. Now, don't, uh, don't hear me say that avoiding triggers is not important as it is, it is very important. I speak with uh, almost all my patients and encourage them to uh, take notes, figure out what their body responds to. Some patients are unaware of certain foods that are inflammatory that their body is sensitive to uh, or different things in the environment. And just having an understanding of what your body is sensitive to can be a huge step in the right direction for someone that struggles with uh, chronic frequent migraines. So in this podcast, we're going to talk about uh, actually nine different triggers. So these are the ones that I see most commonly in the clinic. If there are other triggers that you would like me to hit on or discuss, uh, feel free to comment, uh, reach out to us. I would be happy to uh, know if you experience a trigger that I do not cover today. But these are the ones that I hear most frequently in the clinic. Uh, a couple of these are barriers for me being able to help people because they believe uh, that because they have the certain type of trigger, the treatment that I provide uh, won't be able to assist. And I, wanna, I want to address that as I, I believe that to be a myth um, in a lot of cases. So the triggers we're going to hit on. Uh, first is food triggers. Second, hormones. Third, barometric pressure changes. Uh, fourth would be the lights and sounds. Uh, fifth is smells. And then we have um, physical activity, posture, uh, and then the, the jaw, like clenching, grinding, jaw pain, things like that. Um, so first off, food triggers. Food triggers, uh, some of the more common ones that uh, you'll, you'll find in the research are um, that, that we found just in the clinic are um, like the sweetener aspartame, uh, MSG, the preservative MSG, salty foods, citrus, uh, aged cheese, like fermented cheese, yogurt, uh, red wine's a big one, alcohol, 
uh, is one that a lot of my patients say they have to avoid. And uh, too much or too little caffeine is probably the most common uh, sensitivity when it comes to uh, foods. Now, the other big ones which go along with uh, tempting elimination diets, which uh, can be successful, and we actually have a dietitian that we partner with here at Novera uh, to really give people a good idea of, of how their body responds to foods. So as a physical therapist, I, I am not an expert when it comes to diet, but I have myself um, trialed an elimination diet, and I know that uh, these inflammatory foods can reduce the body's threshold for pain. It, it gives the body something else to deal with, and if it's also dealing with an injury in your neck that's causing a migraine, um, it's likely going to exasperate the migraine uh, if, you, if you give it uh, this type of food uh, that it doesn't already like. So uh, that could be the carbohydrates, um, the sugars, the dairy, um, legumes are another inflammatory food group. Uh, and so uh, one, one of those groups in particular, the dairy, has seemed to pop up in several patients that I have had as a, uh, as a trigger that the patient didn't necessarily think was an issue and then they, they eliminated dairy and uh, they felt um, a lot better. Uh, maybe didn't eliminate the migraines, but the, the, the body was able to cope uh, with the neck injury and so their, their migraines reduced uh, significantly. So first thing to think about is food triggers. What is your body sensitive to? If you go on elimination diet, that can be a good start. If you um, want to go even deeper, feel free to reach out to us. We can connect you with our dietitian. Um, otherwise, connect with the dietitian in your local area and explore what food triggers might look like for you. Now, I need to back up because with uh, food triggers and with hormones, which we're going to talk about in a second, there's uh, and really with, with most all of these triggers, there's two variables that are being manipulated or changed. And this is why someone can come to me that has a very distinct hormone trigger. Uh, once a month, they get a migraine and they can still improve. So if you think of our body as having a threshold for what we can tolerate, and that threshold line is constantly changing. So there's things in the environment, there's things that we ingest, there's uh, barometric pressure changes, there's um, types of postures throughout the day, activities that we do. Um, our threshold for what we can tolerate uh, as far as pain goes is, is constantly fluctuating. So sometimes it's really high and, and we feel great. Sometimes it's really low and we're going to feel every little ache or pain. Um, this might not be a perfect example, but think of when it's cold outside and everything just hurts more. Um, there are certain things that will increase uh, the pain or, or reduce your body's threshold for what you can tolerate. So that's the first thing to consider. Uh, the second thing is that there is this second, uh, there, there is another uh, consideration of the actual source of pain. So just because your threshold's lower doesn't mean that you're just going to have pain. There actually needs to be a source of pain. And when headaches or migraines are in the conversation, there needs to be a source of pain. And so if the neck is the source of pain, there are things that will fluctuate the actual um, pain source. And so Typically, those things are poor posturing, um, certain types of physical activity, uh, maybe having some sort of like uh, situation where you wake up and your neck feels like uh, you slept on it wrong or something like that. So those will increase the actual um, pain sensation. Uh, and then these other things like hormones, food triggers, things like that will actually decrease your body's threshold for pain. So picture these two lines that are constantly fluctuating and when the pain uh when the, when the pain um, generator line passes the your body's threshold line, uh, that's when you're going to experience a headache. Uh, and then when it's when those lines are are really separated, that's going to be more of a migraine uh, type situation. So hopefully that makes sense. I do have a, a graphic of that as well that I use in the clinic. But for the sake of a podcast uh, describing it to you, um, hopefully you can picture that. So the second trigger I want to talk about is hormones. This is one of the more uh, common things I see or discuss with patients. Now, estrogen is a uh, hormone that uh, affects, um, uh, well, hormones in general uh, are filtered through our body. They're, they're running through our, um, our blood vessels, our veins, our arteries, and, and they 
basically affect uh, almost every system uh, in our body. Uh, and so these, these hormones, especially estrogen, uh, in women who are two to three times more likely to experience headaches or migraines, this could be one of the things that uh, does result in, in women having more migraines than a, than a man would. Um, and so the fluctuation in hormones once a month, uh, especially estrogen, will, uh, there's actually studies that show that the, your threshold for what you can tolerate in pain uh, during that time of the month can drop. And uh, so what often happens is there can be a very strong tie uh, from hormones to the migraines that the hormones actually are blamed for the migraines. And uh, I, I have had patients that um, have such a strong connection to their hormones that that's one of the toughest things to break out of. But I have had many patients that have a very distinct hormone-related migraine that get better. Uh, they come in, I evaluate their neck, we find a neck issue uh, that is uh, reproducing the same migraine pain they have, and after working on their neck and improving mobility, they, they get better. So think of that pain generator line dropping. So that threshold is fluctuating during that time of the month. It's usually a five-day five day window around your period, and that threshold's going to drop um, but if that pain generator line is so low, if, if your neck is in good shape, uh, that hopefully won't result in a, a headache or a migraine uh, during that time. So I'm not changing hormones. I'm not doing anything with hormones. Sometimes hormone treatments uh, can be helpful, but I, I like to couple it and uh, take the approach of, hey, if there's a neck problem actually generating the pain, let's address that first. Hopefully that makes sense. So barometric pressure changes, this is another thing that comes up quite a bit. With barometric pressure changes, the, it, the example I give people a lot is if you think of someone that has osteoarthritis, if they have knee pain, maybe they've had a knee surgery or replacement, something like that, they can always tell you when there's going to be a storm coming in, when it's going to rain. And what's happening is that it's, there's a change in the barometric pressure and our joint Actually, there, there's a joint capsule, there's fluid within the joint space, and so that, uh, that pressure um, is going to respond to uh, what the pressure in the atmosphere is, the barometric pressure. And so if there's swelling, if there's irritation, if there's scar tissue, if there's something that's damaged within that joint, it's going to be more sensitive to that. Now, this is also true when it comes to a neck injury. So it makes a lot of sense to think of a headache and migraine as stemming from a joint in the neck that's not happy, just like uh, that in that scenario, the knee would be unhappy. So if this joint in the neck is unhappy, if the barometric pressure is fluctuating, uh, that joint, if it already has an increased amount of pressure due to scar tissue or inflammation, uh, it is going to respond and be more sensitive to a, a storm or whatever the um, pressure in the atmosphere is doing. So that's why patients... Um, who live in places where there's a dramatic change in the barometric pressure might see an increase in the frequency of their migraines. Um, okay, so now we do now we go to uh, lights and sounds. So um, lights and sounds. Uh, basically, this is just a suggestion. The uh, because well, I would say it's more of a, a theory that when a patient is in the midst of a migraine. Uh, the amount of pain that they're experiencing and how the brain is responding to that pain signal is going to create this hypersensitivity in other sensory nerves in the head and the face. And so a sense of smell, uh, but especially lights and sounds can be sensitive when you're in the midst of a migraine. So a couple things to consider is uh, turning on night mode on your phone because blue light can be uh, a trigger for people and that cell phones can be a... Uh, a big part of that. I think I, I work with a lot of patients that uh, are, are tied to their phones quite a bit. And not only is it posture, but it's also the blue light uh, that they are experiencing throughout the day. So consider putting on night mode and uh, putting your phone aside um, maybe a, a half an hour at least before you go to bed. Um, just considering what screen time is doing uh, to your vision. So uh, let's move to smells. So bad smells, we've been experiencing quite a bit of smoke here in Colorado Springs. Uh, paint thinners, car exhaust, pesticides. So um, these are things that have just been 
known as potential triggers for people. Um, a way to kind of counteract that is uh, essential oils can be a soothing um, uh, anti-nausea anti type um, type of smell, uh, namely peppermint, lavender, rosemary, um, eucalyptus, and uh, chamomile. So uh, if you have tried essential oils, um, I would say continue down that road. I have a lot of patients that use essential oils. It can be very soothing and calming for them. Let's move to physical activity. So physical activity is a big one that uh, oftentimes if patients have a trigger of uh, that involves physical activity, that is one of the categories, uh, depending on, on where you get uh, your source, but that can be accompanied with a migraine. So if you think of the patient having a neck injury, you have this 12 pound head that sits on the neck, the neck isn't functioning the way it should, physical activity can be an irritant to the, the underlying neck problem. Uh, running, that, that repeated sort of up and down movement can increase the amount of stress through the neck. Certain sorts of uh, uh, lifts at the gym, so I, I tell people to stay away from like overhead presses because the shoulder can be dysfunctional and increase the amount of tension through the neck. And so physical activity is one to watch out for. There's an asterisk on this though because I want people to exercise, I want people to be active. Usually the sedentary lifestyle uh, is going to be worse for the patient than if they were to uh, go on a walk or hike or jog or things like that. So in general, I want you to move, but be aware that the neck injury that I deal with can be irritated by physical activity. That rolls us into posture. So speaking about sedentary lifestyle, one of the misconceptions is that posture or um, taking a break, lying on the couch, resting can be a, a benefit to someone with headaches or migraines. I would say that the uh, lying on the couch in a funny position and watching a movie is uh, something you should stay away from. The reading late at night in your bed with your neck propped up is something you stay, should stay away from. Um, watching movies late at night in your bed um, is, is something you should stay away from. So that, that sort of like sedentary resting position where your neck is is not in a, in a neutral posture is um, typically a bad thing. That's gonna increase the amount of tension that's gonna irritate uh, this injury that needs to be resolved. And so be aware of what your posture looks like. The other big one is for people that work desk jobs who stay home, especially now, with uh, uh, with the coronavirus, a lot of people are working from home, and so your desk position needs to be uh, at the proper height. Uh, your eye, your eyes should be, or your screen should be at eye level, so you're not having to uh, look down or squint. Um, laptops um, should be used with either a keyboard or a separate screen, so that the screen uh, can be at a separate height from where you're typing, um, especially if you're using it for hours on end. Lastly, let's talk about the jaw. So the jaw is uh, commonly associated with uh, headaches and migraines, jaw pain, jaw dysfunction, popping, clicking, things like that. Dentists will oftentimes work with patients that have headaches and migraines and they'll prescribe and uh, provide a, a night guard or um, a dental appliance, something that uh, assists with the bite or protects the teeth as a lot of patients will find that they clench or grind their teeth in, the, teeth in the middle of the night. So with jaw pain, I work on it quite a bit. It's something that can resolve um, and has a close relationship to the neck. That's something I'll get into more in another podcast as uh, that's an important understanding um, when, when we get into treatment and what treatment looks like. So there you have it. Those are the most common triggers that I see and how I would explain those to a patient, how I would explain those to you if you're at home thinking, I have a hormone trigger, I have a food trigger, how would uh, my neck affect those things? So the most important takeaway, if you didn't hear anything else I said, was that you have to understand, likely your trigger is not actually generating pain, it's lowering your threshold. And there is a pain generator and that pain generator is likely your neck. And so there's two variables to consider. Uh, most people forget 
that or, or overlook that there is a pain generator and it's not just hormones that are causing the headache or it's not just food triggers that are causing the headache um, but there is a pain generator involved likely that's the neck um, so I'm not saying all situations um, I try not to uh, paint with a broad brush but I do think that there's a significantly higher percentage of people that will benefit from uh, evaluation to their their neck making sure that this injury isn't present. Um, and a lot, a lot of those people, many of those people um, are ruling themselves out because they have a strong tie to a food or a hormone change. So there you go. Um, that's that's uh, scratching the surface, but hopefully helpful when it comes to triggers. Um, I would love it if you would share this uh, podcast episode with someone out there who may have told you that they uh, have gone through hormone therapies or they've tried avoiding certain foods and they still haven't found the relief they're looking for. Uh, really anyone with headaches and migraines who's still struggling. Um, another great resource is we have a blog on our website www.noveraheadachecenter.com. Uh, feel free to check that out and then as always we are available for you for in-person care. We start out with a free discovery visit. It's just a half hour. We can do that by the phone. By phone. Uh, virtually or in person and just hear your story and find out if we are a good fit for you. Um, it really doesn't matter where you are. We have people from all over the country, um, uh, across uh, the globe come see us. So um, I am Dr. Taves. This is the Headache Doctor podcast. Thanks for tuning in and uh, check in next time as we'll have more valuable information about headaches and migraines so that you feel empowered uh, to break free from a life in fear of fear and dependence and thrive in everything you do.